Thank you, President Moorhead, for that very kind introduction. I stand before you today with, with great humility, with great hope, great excitement, and a little bit of intimidation because graduation speeches are kind of difficult because you never know what to say, but you, make, you do want to make sure you say it very quickly and get out of the way. But I do, and I thank you all for, for welcoming me here to celebrate with you today because this is, this is indeed an honor. To the University of Georgia faculty who keep this university on the cutting edge of, of research, innovation, education, and learning. To the staff who keep this place running even with when the world stops. To the parents, to the grandparents, to the family, to the friends who've helped these graduates, who've helped you get here today, and to you, the graduates, for getting yourselves to this day, congratulations. Congratulations to you all. Be proud of yourself. Be proud of what you've accomplished. For four, we're, for four years, give or take, you've cried the call of go dogs. Your time here, you've heard the ring of the chapel bell. And th though your better angels and hopeful parents begged you to open the books, you sometimes fell to the pull of the pub, whether it was walkers or cutters or maybe both. But throughout your time here, you've avoided only one thing. You've avoided the arch. You've yielded to superstition and tradition. You've honored hope and faith and awaited the day when you could at long last pass underneath the arch, stepping out of campus and into the world, and a brave new world it is. Graduates, I am here today to tell you that the world you're stepping into is closer than you think. The world that the University of Georgia has prepared you for isn't oceans away, it is right here outside this door. The world is right here. The world is right now. It is in Athens. It's on South Lumpkin. It's on North Thomas. And it's mere blocks from the arch. It is in Augusta and it's in Ackworth. It's in Atlanta. The world you're stepping into is right here in Georgia. It's right here in the South. And the world right here needs you to lead. We need you to lead us into the future. Let me tell you a little about my life journey because it's, I never thought I would be where I am. And as you sit here thinking about what's next, let me share with you some of the, some of the steps of my life to kind of let you know you can be all you can be. Stay hopeful, stay faithful, keep working hard, and good things will happen to you. I was born and raised in a small town called Greenville, Alabama, about 50 miles south of Montgomery. A town of less than 3,000 people in my memory and about 300 miles from here. Greenville was a cutting sew manufacturing town. Even before that, it was a railroad town. Growing up there, there wasn't much glitz or glam, but something altogether even bigger and grander and even more foundational. It was a community of a strong work ethic. My grandmother did not receive a formal education. She made it through the, through the fourth grade. But that work ethic was baked in her bones. And she passed that work ethic on to my mother who became a school teacher and taught generations of students for some 40 years and ultimately handed it down to me. My family, we were proud to be part of that hardworking Greenville community. We loved our church. We loved the local schools, we loved our neighbors, and we loved the local businesses. But we also knew that Greenville wasn't perfect. We lived the imperfections every day, we lived the segregation every day. Back then, Alabama's constitution mandated separate schools for blacks and white students, and dozen more Jim Crow laws were on the books. Laws bearing black people and white people from playing cards, or throwing the football together, or sharing a public pool. As we know, separate ain't equal. Segregation has never and can never afford equal opportunity. One time when I, was, when I was young, my mother was very sick. 
So I took her to the doctor. The doctor's office had two waiting rooms, one for black folks and one for whites. Mother and I waited and we waited and we waited. She was getting sicker and sicker and the doctor never came. Finally, I said, enough is enough. I took my mother to the white waiting room and demanded she be seen. The, doc the doctor treated her, then got rid of the separate waiting rooms altogether. It was a victory that I should never have had to have been won, but it was a victory nonetheless. On that day, I remembered, I learned what it takes to change conditions. It takes sound judgment to recognize even of the most insidious injustices. It takes clear vision to imagine a better future. Above, above all, it takes courage to realize the future and that courage must be relentless. It takes true courage to change the world. Even if your world is about 20 square miles. After I graduated from high school, I went off to college in Michigan and after college, I went to Washington DC, there in the nation capital. I worked in the throes of national politics and as a congressional aide in the 1980s, I stood witness as policymakers who represented every part of the American political system debated legislation that would impact every manner of America. For much of that time, the control of the two chambers in Congress was divided and it soon will be again. It took the courage of Democrats and Republicans to come together, but they did. During my time on the Hill, members of Congress on both sides of the aisle united to pass laws expanding civil rights and extending the Voting Rights Act and establishing a national holiday for Georgia's own Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. It was an honor to serve in Washington and a real thrill, a real excitement, but through it all, Greenville, Alabama and the South and the Southern communities were never far from my heart or from my mind. And for the last 30 years, drawing on that work ethic that I inherited, I've been doing my part to help Alabama and to help Georgia and to help the South be better. At this moment, you might be struggling to recall my introduction because it's been just a few minutes, but hopefully it hasn't felt much longer than that. I am the CEO of Georgia Power, an electric utility company. We light up St Stanford Stadium and we light up actually this Coliseum as well. But our goal is also to ignite change. We are researching and investing in clean and reliable energy sources that will help transform our state and support our economy and all of our communities. And we're helping our own employees to volunteer and strengthen communities all across Georgia. Take it from me, someone who has worked the halls of power both literally and figuratively, no matter what you do next, you can make a difference. You must make a difference. After day today, you will have two main spheres of influence, the professional and the personal. First, let me touch on the professional. You've received a world-class education here and you are the leaders of our communities, the leaders that we need to solve our biggest and most complex challenges and seize our greatest opportunities. Prices in Georgia are on the rise, food, gas, even Christmas trees. I saw one lot in Atlanta where Georgians are paying some 30 or 40% more to buy a tree this year. Now more than ever, we need the economists among you to study the trends and help strengthen our markets and, and guide us through the, this economic period. As infrastructure in Georgia ages, we need the engineers among you to help design, help us to design an electric grid worthy of digital technology in a technology growing era. A grid and infrastructure that embraces the imagination of the metaverse. As children in Georgia make up for the lost learning they suffered during the pandemic, we need the education, educators among you to help bridge the gap. We need our students at earlier ages and grades to make career choices. Our students are up to a year behind in both reading and math, and we have, to work, we have work to do to ensure every child who aspires to walk this stage can do so one day. 
whether your degree is in accounting or advertising, history or philosophy, each and every one of you has the know-how and I hope the can-do attitude to make a difference wherever you are. And when you do, you won't just be changing our communities, you will be changing our nation and you will be changing our world. Like throwing a stone into Lake Herrick, the impact you will make will ripple out, reaching places you've never imagined and people you have never met. But remember, your contributions also exist outside the professional, beyond the nine to five paradigm and your workplace walls. Your contributions are also personal. When I was growing up, as I said, my community was segregated, but today many of the communities are segregated by default. Not just on Sunday mornings at church, has been consistently and correctly noted, but also sometimes at Saturday games and on Friday date nights. Every day of the week at coffee shops and grocery stores, in book clubs and bars, in the friendships and relationships that define our lives. Quantitative research in years past has shown that most Americans don't have many, if any, friends of different races. Anecdotal evidence suggests that people gravitate toward those who share their political party or income level or educational background. Like attracts like, as the saying goes. I'm asking you today, defy the conventional wisdom, defy the cliches, break down the silos. If all your friends look like you and think like you, then by all means, widen your circle. Diversity has become a buzzword, but it is the basis of progress. The experts, including some of those here today, agree. Diverse communities are happier, more productive and prosperous. Diverse viewpoints yield better results. But there's a catch. Fostering diversity, especially within our own circles or in your own lives, takes work, takes hard work. You must have difficult conversations and let yourself be uncomfortable. Lean into the discomfort, ask questions, and listen deeply to the answers. Educate without acquisition and learn without abandon. And when in doubt, serve and give of yourself. Last year, UGA students like yourselves volunteered over 200,000 hours. That's how you strengthen your connections to one another. That's how you build community. There's an African proverb that says, if you want to go fast, go alone, but if you want to go far, go together. When you walk under the arch today, you will not do so alone. You will do so together, but, but to go far does not have to mean miles away. You can stay right here in Georgia, and from right here you can make a difference that truly goes to difference. Congratulations. I wish you the very best and great success. And I look forward to seeing you around the neighborhood. Thank you very much.